And we are live. Welcome everyone, it's uh, 12 o'clock exactly. Um, my name is Stephanie Aiden and I'm the Executive Director with AIA Spokane. And you're joining another remote live and local um, here in Spokane uh, with Architecture Month uh, coming to an end this week. Um, our title this, this year is Resilience in Architecture and today we've got certainly a very appropriate topic, a new paradigm in building enclosures, delivery, performance and durability. Um, this one is AIA approved and it's actually being provided, our provider today is EDU contractors or EDA contractors, and they will be recording the credit. So when you registered, you should have put in your AIA, AIA number. Um, I'll go ahead and send that off to EDA and they will be giving you uh, credit for this course. So welcome everyone. Wanted to go ahead and thank CSI, who is one of our sponsors for Architecture Month this month. Um, They're providing a fun participation factor uh, supporting our Spokane dining scene. So at the end of this webinar, we will be giving away another $50 gift card uh, to a local restaurant. Um, so please stay tuned to the end and we'll make sure and, and give that away. And um, it also at the end of this week, we'll be tallying up all the attendees and what, you, what all events you did attend and we'll be giving another $50 gift card to the people that attended the most presentations throughout the month. So keep uh, going online to aaspokane.org and uh, sign up for the last four events of this week and we'll look forward to seeing it all of those. So today we have an excellent presentation and we've got four presenters with us. We have Corey Robbins, who is the current president of CSI Philadelphia, and he is an established presenter for over a decade and works for EDA contractors, the innovators of the EDA envelope. We have Chris Dixon, recent, who recently joined Morrison Hirschfield as a facade specialist with expertise in building science, building materials, and building enclosure. He is a registered architect with more than 25 years experience in the design construction industry and is certified, um, is a CSI certified construction specifier. And we had Yuge Valvias, um, who is an independent business consultant, scholar, entrepreneur, and principal of Alberti Group. Um, he has lectured and published extensively in the AAC, AEC arena, focusing on legal and public policy issues associated with green building rating systems, high performance buildings, and building specifications. And finally, we have Catherine Jones, who's an attorney and partner with O'Hagan Meyer in Chicago. Catherine devotes a significant amount of her practice to representing architects, engineers, insurance brokers, real estate brokers, and other professionals in the action of alleged in actions alleging professional negligence and malpractice. So with that, I we do encourage Q&A throughout the presentation. Um, go ahead and use your Q&A button down below and we'll make sure and moderate that and pose those questions as we go along or either at the end as, if, as they seem most appropriate. So with that, I'm gonna quit sharing my screen and let Corey take over. Here we go. Yep. How's it look? Looks good to me. All right. Thanks. All right. So um, Chris will be the first one to begin the presentation. But again, we really appreciate everyone having us. We're looking forward to sharing our concept of uh, this great new delivery method that we stumbled upon. So stumbled upon is the wrong word. Here we go. So Chris, there you go. Thanks, Corey. Um, you know, among, among the four of us, as we speak today, you're going to be hearing a lot about the different pieces that each of us kind of bring to this, this idea and this puzzle. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about what our current issues are facing buildings. And um, here's a slide that many people have probably seen these statistics before um, these Statistics come from multiple sources, multiple studies, um, which talk about 
construction costs uh, related to buildings and failures uh, related uh, to those construction costs. And uh, for multiple sources, 2% um, of construction costs are roof insulation issues. 40% of all building related problems are due to water intrusion. Next slide. 70% of all construction litigation uh, comes from water intrusion into a building. Uh, this is something that, that architects like myself have been um, aware of you know, for the entirety of our practice um, and something that we uh, work very hard to try to figure out and very hard to try to prevent happening. Um, but uh, there's so many things that can go wrong and it still is a significant source of construction litigation even today. Um, 60 to 70% of those failures are due to envelope failures, uh, improper installation, or the building enclosure. Next slide. So in order for us to keep water out of a building and to keep the building healthy and durable, we have to focus on, um, on these control layers. And there are four of them critical to the building's performance, water control, air control, thermal control, and vapor diffusion control. If these control layers are all dealt with simultaneously uh, throughout the design and construction of the envelope, chances are you will not have problems with the building enclosure. Next slide. So I thought it would be interesting to take a look at uh, a building that as architects, we are all very familiar with and aware of. This is the um, Bauhaus building in Germany by Walter Gropius. Um, I thought it was interesting to use this as an example of what we're faced with today, because when this was built, um, there wasn't necessarily a lot of consideration um, being, being paid to these different control layers. And the other thing that's interesting about this building is it sort of started um, a, a trend that we see today, uh, modern architecture, where um, some of the things that were taken for granted in building a building to keep water out have sort of disappeared. You know, one of those being overhangs, for example, um, not so much fenestration, for example, um, uh, big clunky fat walls uh, now has been replaced with thinner structure. Um, and a lot of that we still, we still deal with today. Those, those changes that really kind of started in, in the modernist movement have created a lot of additional problems for us that today have sort of come full circle and, and been a, a real um, a collision of problems for buildings uh, because of all the stuff that we learned prior to this movement uh, that we've sort of forgotten. And if you can click through the illustrations, Corey, um, we're going to look at the water control layer first. And you can see that as each of these layers gets highlighted on the slide, um, my point is to show that there are many different types of things that have to be looked at for water penetration. There's uh, balcony issues, there is the facade, there is below grade waterproofing, um, there is a roofing membrane and plaza deck membrane. Keep clicking through, Corey, I think these will pop up. Um, and what you're seeing here you see the different colors represent different assemblies and different systems. They're all keeping water out of the building, but they're quite different in how they're applied to the building and how they're designed and how they interface. Next slide. Uh, the next one is, is air. And uh, hit the button again, uh, designated in pink. One of the most important things that we deal with on a daily basis is um, air movement in and out of a building. Uh, we have to control the air movement in order to be able to control condensation that can occur uh, both inward and outward, depending on the climate zone that you're in. So that's adding another layer of complexity in generally these areas that are being highlighted here that has to be um, addressed in addition to the water control layer. Next slide. Uh, thermal, uh, this is something that's becoming uh, more and more of an issue uh, because energy codes are ever ratcheting upward in their requirements. Um, I do a lot of work out of the uh, city of Seattle. I'm in Seattle. And as most of us on the call know that are from Washington state, we have some of the most stringent energy codes uh, in the country. 
uh, the city of Seattle being probably the, the most stringent of any jurisdiction I've ever worked in, um, and the state's certainly not far behind that. So as more and more and more requirements uh, are introduced into the energy code, it, it becomes even more critical that um, there's an understanding, a deep understanding of what it means you know, to calculate a U-value properly and how that impacts um, each individual assembly and how those assemblies again interface. Next slide. And the last control layer is vapor. And this is vapor diffusion, which is different from air. Uh, some people sometimes confuse these two as being the same. They are not the same, they're very different. Um, we're fortunate in most uh, parts of the state in Seattle not to have to deal too much with vapor diffusion, but there are certain critical areas of a building that you have to pay attention to no matter what the climate zone is. And here's an illustration here, the orange layers, um, specifically for the slab on grade condition and to a lesser degree in Washington state, uh, roofs and walls. Next slide. The critical junctures of all of these colliding control layers are where we focus or should be focusing our attention. And this is where most of the failures occur. So where you've got all these different uh, colored highlighted assemblies. It is also true that you will have on a construction site um, a different trade representing the installation of these colored assemblies. None of these trades are working very well together, typically with an understanding or a clear roadmap as to how all these things need to be integrated in order to make sure that all of these different control layers are working properly. And it's these interfaces that uh, end up causing the, the lion's share of what we talked about in the earlier slides of construction litigation. It's where these things come together. It's typically not the field of these assemblies, it's where all of these things intersect. And as these become more and more complicated and are ratcheted up, uh, these critical um, intersections become more difficult to solve and more difficult to uh, carry out uh, uh, properly. Next slide. And it goes up from here. Um, we are faced with not only dealing with those four control layers and how they all intersect and how they're going to be working properly, but we are also as design professionals and contractors dealing with much more. Uh, design delegation uh, is one of these things where uh, it's difficult sometimes to know who's responsible you know, for what when the contract documents are delegating the design responsibility to the contractor. Um, how's that being done? Uh, how's a contractor supposed to make sure that um, he or she has the information available to correctly design those things, right? And how is that information being conveyed by the design professional to the contractor if it is conveyed at all? And oftentimes it isn't. Um, secondary structural attachments. Uh, this comes up more and more and more, especially with design delegation. Who is the responsible party for making sure that, for example, a curtain wall system is properly attached to the building? The structural engineer typically doesn't have that in his or her base uh, service, right? And so uh, it's sometimes the case that uh, during construction, these questions come up. This is the wrong time for us to be addressing this kind of a question. So this is adding another layer of complexity to all, all of us as design professionals and contractors as to how we need to get this uh, incorporated into the design documents and whether or not it's delegated. And if so, how are all of these things coming together to make an effective structure and an effective building? Air barrier testing requirements. Um, everyone that works in the state of Washington understands this because this has been a requirement in the state of Washington for quite a few years now. Um, it has been the case that um, if you didn't pass the whole building air barrier leakage test, you got away with not having to do anything. Uh, that is changing in Washington State and the city of Seattle uh, under the new energy code, where if you cannot pass the whole building air leakage test, you have to retest until you do pass. So if you have gaping holes in your air control layer at those critical intersections that we just illustrated earlier, um, sometimes those are impossible to fix in the field once that's already been put together. Um, thermal bridging. This is something, again, that has been largely uh, 
ignored. And um, for the most part, energy code uh, officials have turned a blind eye to, but again, Washington State, City of Seattle, sort of taking the lead on making sure that thermal bridging is addressed properly and making sure that it's incorporated into the design. This is an area that is particularly vexing and difficult for uh, the average design practitioner to deal with because to solve this requires sometimes a very deep thermal analysis, which not a lot of design practitioners really have the ability to undertake. Um, and so professionals like Morrison Hirschfield um, that do have that capability are stepping in to help design professionals understand how this needs to be done um, in order for you to now pass those requirements in the energy code. Building codes, um, you know, building codes uh, are not getting any, any easier either. And we are seeing more and more introduction of things that touch the envelope that are sometimes difficult or impossible to solve. Um, one of them is um, uh, NFP 25, which is a uh, vertical uh, fire propagation test that has to be done for the entire assembly. Um, this has largely been sort of ignored by the design industry, the construction industry, because it's very difficult to achieve when you have all of these different assemblies. And this test requirement says that if you have certain things in the assembly that trigger this requirement, the entire assembly has to be tested, which is oftentimes very cost prohibitive. Um, and lastly, energy codes. And I think I've spoken enough about that, but suffice it to say that we are only gonna see more and more and more of this. Um, Washington State is a leader in this. And so we have an advantage perhaps um, um, for, for, from other jurisdictions and states that eventually, in my opinion, will also be adopting this. It used to be that warm climates didn't have much to say about this for insulation, but that isn't the case anymore. With the adoption of the International Energy Conservation Codes uh, among all 50 states, um, that is something that's required now for, for every climate zone. Uh, next slide. So really, our goal here is to solve for everything. Um, it's critical that we can solve for all of those things in order to keep your building functioning the way it needs to be, to keep it durable, uh, and to avoid costly and, and troublesome litigation that is still plaguing the industry. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to Corey. Thanks, Chris. Uh, much appreciated. Um, the brains behind the operation. Well done, sir. Um, so what we wanted to talk about was basically the exterior, you know, enclosure contractors perspective, right? So my company's name is EDA Contractors. We're out of Philadelphia. Uh, we started as a roofing and waterproofing installer. And when that rain screen uh, train was racing across the Atlantic, uh, we jumped in front of it. And, you know, we that's our niche when it, when it comes to insulation around in our area and our region in the East Coast is rain screens, very difficult, you know, vegetative roofing assemblies. And what we saw about 15 years ago was this loophole in rain screen material warranties, right? So you have a very, very uh, basic and essential problem is that, you know, you have a cladding warranty and the air vapor barrier warranty. And as soon as the air vapor barrier is punctured, uh, that warranty is done. And if there's a leak, it falls on the workmanship or the installer, right? So we kept running into that. And it's, uh, as you can see, it's very, it's expensive. It was one of those things that we kept, our company kept getting dragged into these, um, you know, lawsuits to, to, to fix the building, to fix these leaks. And we realized it was a very, very expensive game to play. And we just didn't want to do that anymore. Uh, we continue to get dragged back into it. I could go into exactly where the loophole lies, but um, if you, you know, that was the first step. So what our idea was is to lean into the risk. Uh, we saw that if we were installing the AVB or we were installing the cladding, terracotta, uh, aluminum composite material, whatever it might be, we decided, you know what, if we're going to do one, we need, we need to do both to be able to control and mitigate our risk as much as we possibly can. So that was our first step. Um, we told all the owners, anybody who was willing to listen to us, that if you give us both of these um, for 10 years, we'll come back if there's any leaks. There's no reason to have a blame game at the end. It's just not worth the money. It's not worth the risk. Um, so we kind of came in that way. And if there was a problem, we would come out and fix it. It was never cheap you know, to put up a swing, peel off these panels, 
find the leak in the air of a barrier and patch it. Um, but it's certainly cheaper than trying to fight it in uh, court and you know through litigation. Um, yeah, so sorry, there's a question that just came in. So I was hired back in 2016 for a specification attack, if you will, because we thought that, man, if we could raise that level of standard on the projects we're being involved in with institutional commercial owners, uh, we'll have the ability that anyone else who's installing the cladding would have to raise to our standard, which was to supply a 10-year workmanship watertight warranty to whoever is installing the metal panels. Uh, they would be rely. I mean, or they would be responsible for the water tightness underneath of them because the way we saw it, that was implied anyway. Um, we just kept getting into that issue. We, we, we got it into some projects. And then as we went, we realized that specification was really only a very small part of the problem. This loophole that exists in rain screens, it's all over the building. You know, um, it's not a new thing. It's just the blame game that happens, exactly what Chris said. Well, who did this? Well, who was responsible? Well, who's liable? It was just a very difficult um, uh, red tape to go through and no one really knew exactly where it landed and it turned into a very expensive uh, post-completion issue. So our next step, if you will, uh, we were engaged with uh, Ujval who helped us kind of uh, see the light and he introduced us to Chris Dixon and Morrison Hirschfield. So I gotta give a shout out to them because they uh, are tremendous um, both of you guys, we wouldn't be where we were if we didn't all come together. Uh, but what we realized was that rain screen was only part of the problem. As Chris mentioned earlier, the transitions between all these materials, not just the AVB and the cladding, but the AVB up to the roof, to the curtain wall, to the windows, to the water, underground waterproofing, those are all potential uh, serious, you know, expensive issues if they come up to play in the end. Um, so we realized we think we could install all of these basically ourselves, but we also were not foolish enough to think that we knew everything, you know. And as we engaged with Uzval, we knew that there was a lot of unknown unknowns. Um, and then we have been engaged with building consultants all over the East Coast. You know, I can name a lot of them and bore you to death, but I'm not going to do that. Um, but then when we finally ran into Morris or Hirschfield and we realized that they had the ability and the wherewithal and the, I guess, the want, if you will, to stamp and seal our shop drawings. That's when we realize, oh, this is the keystone we've been looking for. And as Chris said, kind of the puzzle pieces coming together, you know? Um, so our number one priority was to align our interests with the owner. Uh, that was really important for us because we wanted them to know that, you know, we're not just some installer coming in there to make a buck and run. We know that return business is very important when you're in the commercial realm as well as institutional owners, hospitals, colleges, you know, things like that. They, you want to have a return customer, do a great job, come back when something goes wrong uh, to continue to get work in the future. Um, so we talked with Morris or Hirschfield and Chris, and we realized that our interests were very much aligned, yet even though we're always on the opposite side of the table on most projects that we're working on. So we talked a little bit and we said, man, if we could be on the same side of the table, we would be dangerous. And we could really get some great buildings up. Um, and that's where we really started kind of, like, you know, pulling our sleeves up to figure out if this would truly work. So what we wanted to do was have the architect and the owner delegate the design of the exterior envelope over to EDA contractors. But we would then have Morris or Hirschfield underneath of us versus across the table. Because no matter what, a building envelope consultant, their job is to make sure that thing does not leak. And they're going to put the gold standard, gloves, hat, suspenders, belt, whatever other clothes you can think of, right? And they're right, you know, but on the other side of the table is the installer. You know, we bid it at a certain price. We need to be in that number or we're going to be in some trouble and start losing money. And all we want to make sure is that it's economically effective. You know, we want to make sure it doesn't leak because then we have to come back, but we can't put on all those different layers because the owner would just be throwing money away. So the idea was for us to be on the same side of the table, an architect, architect give us their design intent, performance requirements, which are, I can't say enough, critical to the success of a building. Uh, the performance requirements and the design intent, we then go into a room, and close all windows and doors, and roll up our sleeves and make sure that we can build the building the way that the architect is aesthetically um, 
uh, envisioning it to happen. And then this would knock a lot of the uh, pricing out of the pre-con discussions because it's all just happening between us and Morris and Hirschfield to make sure this thing comes to life. Um, it was a really, really great idea. The one thing that we stumbled upon that we didn't realize uh, through one very quick project, we had a little project over here where we had Morris and Hirschfield work with us, is how much we knew we would be learning a lot from them. Uh, build, working in building science, our company's in the trenches. Uh, even though our field guys are very much understood on how to put stuff together, when it comes to building science, they don't have AIA <laughs> events like this. Chris goes to them all the time. He knows he's forgotten more about the building envelope than our company knows as a whole. You know what I mean? So we would connect with him, learn more building science than we could, and they would be able to learn from us. That's the thing we didn't realize would be happening. Logistic, lead times, labor, how long it takes to put down, you know, 10 squares a man per day. Like that's something that building envelope consultants just simply are not aware of. You know what I mean? And the sharing of that knowledge to create a better team environment and to save the owner money. That is the change that we're really trying to show. Uh, and it's, you know, it's a, it's a really interesting concept that we've come up with. So this is more of just a visualization for you to understand. The one on the left, I'm sure everyone knows how it's like, you know, for the current process, there's 50 gears playing. If one thing goes wrong, it just gets really, really messy. We're trying to, you know, decrease the gears, if you will, and have it so that um, the risk is mitigated and controlled by one company who has to deal with it. So we were willing to give up a 10-year workmanship warranty, which would be watertight, uh, weather tight, if the owner uh, wanted that. Um, and then we partner up with um, Morris or Hirschfield to kind of put that together. And last but not least, before I hand it off to Ujval and he brings us home, if you will, um, you know, our extended warranty responsibility, you know, we, you know, we know that it would take go for 10 years. We're not saying that it's going to leak after 10 years. We're aiming for a 50, 75, 100 year building. That's what these owners want. Every owner wants that. But there are only institutional owners who are willing to really want that and pay for it, if you will. Um, and that's what this is kind of going after. Um, yeah, we, we just know that the material warranties that exist now, exist now they, they're just simply not enough. And it ends up falling on the installer. So our idea was to have the kind of, um, it says it there, the umbrella or the safety net. You know, if something does leak, there's no, well, is it, is it this manufacturer's fault? Well, is it, is it the glass? Well, is it here? Is it, no, there's nowhere. It's, it's the, the, the saying that we continue to use, and I'm sorry to be a little bit um, odd with that, is that it's, it's one throat to choke. There's one company, you make one call, there's no reason to bring in all the lawyers to figure out who's at fault. You just bring in EDA, hey, Morsa Hirschfield, come help us. They stamped the drawings way in the beginning of the shop drawings to put the design liability so they are also on the hook so that we're all in it together. And if something goes wrong, okay, let's roll this up. Let's figure out what happened. Let's see what happened so we can fix the next one and be better next time. Uh, and it, it, it changes the entire dynamic of the installation and pre-con for that matter. So um, that's our concept in a nutshell. It's, uh, I think Ujval is gonna kind of go into it and explain it a little bit better uh, or the, all the implications that go with that. So I will hush up. Thank you, Ujval. Thanks, Corey. Uh, I'm not sure I'll explain it better, but we'll explain it further. Let's put it that way. <clears throat> um, maybe we should just go back to the very beginning just for a minute, because I think the notion of the idea, the notion of its uh, ability to help buildings be more resilient, which is also a very important concept, because the durability of that building envelope is really what's going to lead to the resilience of that building, or at least have a significant impact on that. Um, and so really what I like to talk about for a lot is it, it, this is a problem of trusting people, but you have to verify and you've got to go beyond that problem, which is that more and more the way in which you have the disaggregated parties, it makes it particularly difficult because you've got multiple layers of contractors, you've got multiple layers of design professionals, and ultimately it's very difficult to figure out who's doing what. And in the end, it, one of the hardest things is that there are too many people who will escape responsibility or act opportunistically within this setup. And so you can never develop the trust because you can't properly verify. 
and we'll talk a little bit about that, and Katie knows a great deal about this, that when you're talking about design defects or construction defects, uh, post-occupancy or three years down the road, you have a, a sort of latent defect problem. It's very hard to figure out what's wrong. It's not always just, hey, yes, that's that pinhole. We just, you know, we can just patch it and we're ready to go. And so none of the parties post facto, as it were, trust each other because nobody's willing to take responsibility and everybody's pushing responsibility somewhere else. Now, architects uh, and owners and contractors obviously have different sort of arenas within which they operate. And the difficulty here, and this is what I think is important that both Corey and Chris talked about is that once you start to take the owner's perspective, you have a better way of really wrestling with this problem, which is the owner is looking uh, to the help of the design professionals and the contractors to do something that he can't do himself. As we know, there are plenty of owners that self-perform. If you're a specialist in doing certain types of, uh, you know, chips that are made with specialty deposition technology and the machines, each one of them costs, you know, a half a million a piece and you want to build the building and it has to be a perfect clean room. Those guys do it themselves. They, 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 don't, they don't trust other people to do it. But in general, most owners, institutional or otherwise, have to trust other parties to fulfill their needs for built assets. And that's the reason for the construction industry. So for Corey, for Chris, for myself, for Katie, what we're really talking about here is that how are we going to merge the design issues with the performance issues, which are of course, built around the installation of that exterior envelope. We know by now, and I think Chris has made it very clear, many of the people on this uh, webinar will know, uh, architects gave up the ghost of knowing the inner details of how the building envelope comes together you know, quite a while ago. And if they do, they hire subconsultants to do this work. But the dilemma is that hiring the subconsultant still creates a bifurcated risk profile that the, what the design professional and their sub expert is doing is still very different from what the installer and the contractors have to do. So what Corey's talking about in this particular case is to merge that and the way you do that contractually is it's a design build situation within which you carve off the building envelope as a designed build chunk and EDA is a contractor and Morrison Hirschfield of course, it, it could be others, I suppose, and in the future, we hope that there are, that people learn to, to come together in that way. It's the same thing as was done many, many years ago when you know, architects no longer took any responsibility for the fire protection or the sprinkler systems or those types of things. And no, 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 we're not responsible. We don't know it. We're gonna send that over into a design build team and you have a whole bunch of either MEP engineering people or contractors who specialize in that. And they absorb the risk for that. And so that's really what's going on here is you're realizing that this particular thing, which for Katie and myself are very important because the risk <clears throat> and the losses for claims and litigations associated with these buildings are overwhelmingly in the building envelope. And to the degree that you have those claims and that litigation, it's a waste of money for all parties. It's a waste of time for all parties. So to make the construction industry the design industry and ultimately the owner's need for built assets more efficient, we have to be able to put the knowledgeable people together with the, the folks who are doing the installation and take responsibility in the way that each can take responsibility. Morrison Hirschfield is not gonna take anything beyond their professional responsibility, but the minute they stamp, that becomes serious. It's not just, I put a 60 page report together and I made some, you know, statements about what might be a great idea or not and give it to the owner and I got a check and I'm happy. In, in our world, we wanna avoid people who are fat, dumb and happy. <laughs> we, we, we want people who are sort of leaner, understand they're at the risk and have to really be trusted and know that what they're doing has to get verified. Okay, next. So this is partly what I was talking about and it has to do with the current warranty structure. We didn't go into the details of the current warranties and the different types. There are really four fundamental types of warranties. We won't go into the details because we don't have time here, uh, but realize that product liability 
and the warranties associated with product liability do not protect either the owner or really any of the parties. They're structured to protect the manufacturer. Nothing wrong with that. That's, that's a business decision about the way in which they operate. And yeah, there are a few manufacturers who are trying to do something that's beyond that. But a lot of that has to do with uh, sort of, it's basically like buying cable. They're trying to bundle stuff for you, <clears throat> right? And so it's like, wait, if you buy my, you know, this TPC and you, and you buy all the other pieces that go along with it, uh, we'll give you this kind of a warranty. It's basically a sales technique, uh, which uses the warranty as a mechanism to not necessarily fool people, but at least seek opportunistically for what people are after. And then you've got the standard one year contractual rectification period. Um, but you know, for most of the people on this call who are aware of this, you may realize that depending on when that rectification period starts, it may be when the material is put in. And if your building takes 18 months to build and you put it in already nine months ago, well, now you got a problem. Your coverage for the owner is a very short time frame. And then when you get to this sort of contractual rectification period, there's always a possibility of litigation and claims associated with that as well. What we wanna do is we wanna stop uh, the sort of hiccuping on the way to getting the solution to, as Corey said, okay, you've got to solve it directly, okay? Uh, what, one of the funniest parts about a lot of this stuff is that everybody in the industry knows this. Sometimes they're difficult to talk about, but all manufacturers warranties are a trap for the unwary. And this is the kind of thing that the owner almost never understands. Even architects or specifiers may not fully understand. I've had many conversations with architects and specifiers <clears throat> where they think that by filling in a blank and making it, you know, five years instead of the one year, they've done it, you know, they've done well by the owner, but in fact, all they did was jack up the price of everything that was involved. And they forgot the piece of the warranty that says that you can't transfer this warranty to anybody else. So now the owner can't, you know, when they have to sell the building, if it's within warranty, that warranty doesn't transfer, which is fatal to the value of the warranty. These are just a few examples, but the more we looked into this, it became evident that really what it requires is somebody to take responsibility. But when EDA started to do this, they understood that they can't take full responsibility until they have somebody who really knows the building science and the two of them can come together to deliver it. Because even if they have whatever specifications they're given, now they don't control it, really the underlying mechanism by which to solve the problem. All they can do is say, we did our part, that's it. Here, what we're looking to do is that just as, and I think uh, Chris had a great sort of term for this. It's like how to solve for all. Now, none of us is naive enough to think that we can solve for all the possible variables that are involved because construction is a complex enterprise. Uh, but let's try to get closer to out of a scale of one to 10, let's try to get closer to nine than one. And so our, our task here is to move toward improvement. Okay. And we do want to think very much about manufacturers warranties having this problem, which is its hair trigger vitiation of coverage. And, the, and you alluded to it earlier, Corey, most people are not aware of the inner details of what these warranties are and even more how all these warranties intersect, right? One of the classic ones is adhesives and sealants. How long do the adhesives and sealants last? How are they warranted compared to the uh, other pieces of the envelope system? And so once you start to see that you've got contrary warranties or limited warranties, it's really your, in chemistry, they call it the limiting reagent problem, right? The kinetics of your reaction are limited by a particular thing. And no matter what you do, you can't make the kinetics go any faster because it's there. Go ahead, next. So, you know, as I discussed earlier, this is a very challenging, but I think very interesting way to proceed because instead of following, and this is me speaking, I'm gonna be editorializing a little, I apologize. But instead of following some trend that gets featured in ENR or something else, it's better to go back to first principles, just say, what has to be done? What are we trying to solve? If you don't understand the problem correctly, then you know, 
getting a new software package is gonna solve this problem. So really what you've got to do is, you know, this building envelope, the scope of that work has to be separated and stand on its own and then be combined with the installer in a manner in which that little piece is optimized. And that is a real value to the owner. Because I think uh, Corey said some very useful things here, which is that both sides are learning from each other. And that was one of the things we really look forward to is that each side begins to understand what the issues really are with the other party so that they can both design correctly and build correctly. Instead of the designer, you know, blue collar versus white collar crap. Most people in the construction industry realize that that is not productive at all, especially if you have in mind the owner. Okay, so. Uh, I'm going to, I realize that, you know, we don't have that much time, so I'm going to try to, I think there's only one more slide if I'm not mistaken, but so uh, there's, there's an issue here, which is real, which is about how do you cooperate, but I tend to be um, more about the, the verification piece, the trust, but verify the cooperation is great, but you've got to have the responsibility behind it. Too much of the conversation in construction or other fields uh, valorizes cooperation as though just because you cooperated, you're going to get a good outcome. Doesn't work that way. I mean, it's great to cooperate because, you know, you can at least go and have a beer with the guy. You don't hate his guts. You know, there's, there's a frictional cost when you hate the other guy's guts, but you, you minimize that. But it isn't at all clear that just because you cooperated, you get a good outcome. And for the owner, whether the contractor and the others hate each other or love each other is not as important as having his building perform and even more to get the building envelope to perform, which absorbs the largest portion of the potential risk for that built asset downstream. This is especially true for institutional owners, because as you said, they're looking not for a 10 year building that they're gonna flip in year five, they're looking for 10, 15, 20, even more if they can get it. Okay, and so anybody who tells you they want a 25, 30, 40, 50 year building, and frankly, isn't using this system seems to me to be shooting in the dark. Right? if you're building envelope specialists who are really responsible and have stamped the drawings are not working hand in glove with the people who are gonna install that whole assembly, not just a little piece of it, install that whole assembly, you're just hoping. And as they say, hope is not a strategy, <laughs> you know, or hope is not a plan. Um, so the, I'm gonna to go to the last point here on this because it's really crucial, I'll go back to it, which is that the designer has to take responsibility as well as the contractor. And only people, and I will say this blankly, there are many, many people who became suddenly building envelope experts when, you know, about 10 or 15 years ago, this sort of stuff began, let's put it that way. Uh, but, your capacity to take responsibility means that you will necessarily self-select for those types of designers for the building envelope who know how to really take responsibility as opposed to just offer advice. And owners get so much advice, it's insane. They don't need another guy to give them advice. They need a couple of people to really do it. And so that's what essentially this was about. Last slide, please. And so as the designer has to take responsibility, it's really, really crucial that the contractor understands what it means to take responsibility, which is very different here than it is just in the way that they're used to doing it. Previously, the way they would think about taking responsibility is, hey, it's in the specification. I did what I was supposed to do. I had a great low bid. You know, they didn't see this in the specification. So I was able to bid lower than the other guys. I'm in. And as long as I do that, I fulfilled my responsibility for this project. And if they don't like it, sue me, right? We don't wanna take that attitude. And our attitude really is that the 10 year warranty has to be appropriately backed. That's a crucial part that uh, Katie will talk about, the right insurances, <coughs> excuse me, the right warranty backup. And of course, ultimately it's backed up by uh, 
you know, the financial health of EDA and the parties that are involved. Um, what does this do for the contractor? From the beginning, he's fully incentivized the QA, QC for the installation and the discussions with the designer are about solving the problem. That there, there's no way out, right? It, it, it's just not gonna work because Morrison Hirschfield is not gonna stamp a drawing which is for the convenience of the contractor, right? And so the QA, QC folks can't just say, hey, look, we'll figure it out somewhere or another, it doesn't matter, as well as the QA, QC onsite is significantly improved because of the risk that they have to bear. Now, frankly, every party who understands this structure understands that they're doing this for the risk management benefits. Right. They're managing their own risk. As Corey said, they realized early on, yeah, well, let, let me put it slightly differently. Corey is, and EDA are not giant contractors. I don't mean that in a bad sense, but you know, if you're a gigantic contractor, you don't care. You've got your own in-house legal team. You got people who you pay all the time. It's always whatever, we fight on every project. That's just part and parcel of a project. Sure, we'll, 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 we'll try that weird technique to try to get some of this money back this way. It's worth a shot. In a weird kind of way, EDA contractors is just in the zone where they actually have to really worry about their litigation costs because it could have an impact on their bottom line, right? But it's large enough to be able to pull off something like this and to think it through really small contractors won't do this because they're sort of just going, you know, hand to mouth in their operation, okay? Obviously, you know, Katie will say just a few words about this. Uh, we have to solve not just the risk management issues, but we've got to solve the legal issues. And that's what we spend a lot of time thinking about. How do we manage that? How do the contractual schemes work? How do the insurance schemes work? Uh, and that's the kind of thing that EDA has taken time and energy to uh, address. A lot, lot of other entities haven't done that. And so that, that to me is, is a good thing that they've sort of understood they better figure that out. And then finally, one of the advantages is for the owner is that EDA can simply manage all the manufacturer's warranties that are part and parcel of that assembly going forward. This, this saves facilities managers, it saves a lot of time, energy, effort from the owner's side post-occupancy of the building, right? And that's the way in which all the different manufacturers warranties will be managed, okay? Is there a last slide or is this it? This is it, right? Okay, oh, one more, okay. <clears throat> so verification and beyond. So uh, I shouldn't be mean, but- <clears throat> I, think this is, I think this is Katie's part. Oh, no, no, you're right. I apologize. Okay. That's all right. No problem. Uh, I just knew it was mine because I use this term, no gold plating. Uh, uh, you know, no gold plating on the side of the designer, right? Uh, and no convenient ignorance on the side of the contractor. Right? It's like, hey, I don't see it. I can get away with doing it this way on the contractor when they're bidding or when they're estimating or whatever it is. And no putting in 18 different options because you don't know the difference of how to solve for the exact one or two options that should apply here. And then ultimately it's a truly shared risk. All right, so this is, um, I'll say something sort of a little bit uh, off the topic, but ultimately directly on the first principle of this issue. <clears throat> one of the crucial parts of economics is to understand that nobody should make money if they don't take risk. Attempts to minimize risk to zero indicate that you should get paid nothing. Because if there is zero risk, anybody can do it. The problem is you should be paid for the risk and for taking the responsibility. And of course, in terms of the economic principles here, you'll be able to find a particular number that you can charge or not charge given the market conditions that are out there and what owners want. At some point, an owner will say, look, hey, I love this idea, but you're gonna charge me double what the next guy is, forget it. I'm gonna take my chances, okay? So that allows you to optimize the role of the responsibility for the extraction of the profits or the revenue that are involved. There's still a mechanism in place. And then, you know, all I can say is that 
if you continue to do this on a regular basis, it will become like how you did design build for fire prevention. Most people don't even think about it. Those guys over there take care of it. Right? It, it, it's not like, oh my God, I need to learn the latest technology in fire prevention is linked to this, that, or the other. No, you don't care. Somebody else is gonna take care of that. And the beautiful thing here is it, it's got nothing to do with the aesthetics of the building at all, right? The exterior decoration of the building can be done in any way whatsoever, but these guys have to figure it out, optimize it for the value that it generates for the owner. And so you've got a joint design build delivery that's really structured for cooperation with responsibility. And that always means it's gonna be about the ultimate performance and understanding the performance of that building, right? Um, I put this last thing in here only because there's so many people who've gone to do IPD or other types of IPD light or something and feel very comfortable doing that when the underlying research or basis for many of these things to increase productivity is essentially zero. There are lots of anecdotal things out there. Uh, I, I think what we're presenting here has significantly greater value for an owner than pursuing an IPD. IPD is about cooperation, not knowing how you really get teeth. That's why everybody does IPD light because when people finally figure out, wait a minute, I'm actually responsible, then they're like, whoa, I can't really do that. All right, so I hope that helps. Uh, and I think this is, I mean, we're anxious to get questions and interact. So I'm gonna shut up and let Katie finish up here so we can uh, try to get some, uh, some questions where people dig at us. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Uh I, fortunately for all of you, I only have this one slide with three short bullet points, but we did kind of want to end our presentation talking a little bit about what the legal bit of this would look like. And so what would a warranty look like eventually uh, for this type of delivery? And I think the answer is it could look a lot of different ways and it could be done on a bespoke manner depending on the project. Uh, but a couple of things I just wanted to highlight to get people thinking, and Ujval touched on a bunch of them, but you know, one of the issues is that warranties ultimately are designed to not have to pay them. And so um, I know you're not supposed to say that, but that's, uh, you know, I write them and you design them in such a way so that you're protecting your client. And so if you're a product manufacturer, the warranty is always going to say it depends on installation being done in conformance with the manufacturer's recommendations. And if you can ever show me a job where you can go back and actually confirm or not confirm that something was installed per a manufacturer's recommendations, it will be the first time I've seen it. So you inevitably get into a he said, she said, and, you know, dispute resolution and potentially litigation. And so, you know, what the idea for this warranty would be is that it encompasses all the warranties for the building envelope within it. And so obviously there would need to be some exclusions, uh, you know, structural would be one that would likely be excluded. But the overarching idea of this warranty would be that it's managed in such a way that it includes all the warranties underneath it. So that would also include taking the manufacturer's warranties and having them transferred under the building envelope warranty in such a manner that the timeframes are the same, a lot of the conditions are the same, and they're being managed by one entity so that you know, the left hand knows eventually what the right hand is doing and you don't have, for instance, a developer that's holding a bunch of warranties that may or may not be transferable that then get handed over to an association or owners who don't actually know if they're transferable or what the timeframes are or any of that nature. So uh, that is, you know, one of the things we've really been looking at in terms of what could this warranty look like. Um, a big part of this too has been the insurance issues and how do we manage the insurance to back the warranty. One of the big issues obviously is that you have different types of liability from an insurance perspective and I will not bore anyone getting into the weeds of insurance law here, but professional liability is typically, uh, you know, such that your engineer would have is insured under a totally different scheme than a contractor's liability would be insured. Uh, and it's insured under a different type of policy and they tend to be for the most part mutually exclusive. 
And so what would that look like? Well, we've done a lot of work to look at how those um, insurance issues would get resolved, whether they're through creating a special captive insurance company that would write this type of risk, or whether it would be insured under traditional schemes and dispute resolution would be done behind the scenes uh, through you know, some sort of binding dispute resolution mechanism that would then take all of the warranty and other you know, types of insurance issues out of the claimant slash owner's hands. Um, and finally, just to touch on you know, legal issues that we all see, I mean, the way the current system is set up is it incentivizes entities on a construction site to sue one another at the end of the day. And there have been a number of schemes. If those of you that are familiar with owner controlled insurance programs or contractor controlled insurance programs that have been developed through the years to try to eliminate these incentives such that you are incentivized to work together to solve problems because it eliminates not only the uh, claims costs after a problem happened, but the transaction costs before a problem happens. Uh, but ultimately, these types of schemes have been somewhat successful, but not completely successful. And so the idea of this warranty really would be that you it is set up in such a manner that whatever dispute resolution happens is happening behind the scenes um, and in such a manner that it really does incentivize the parties to work together because they're so interrelated that the liability is gonna be intertwined. Um, and with that, I see we are definitely getting up against our time. So I'm gonna concede the floor so that we can answer any questions if there are any. Well, maybe we bludgeoned them into silence here. <clears throat> well, no, there, there were questions asked in yeah. the Q&A and uh, Chris and I have been kind of- uh, Okay, all right, good, good. It might be worth, uh, I don't know if everybody saw the answers, it might be worth just restating it if there, if we don't have any further questions, just so everybody knows what was being asked. I don't know if everybody was looking. Sure. The, the, the first one was recommendations on the most cost effective method for a rooftop deck that won't leak. That is uh, outside of this presentation. <laughs> and we could do an entire session on that. Um, that would, we, we could answer that uh, outside of this. Um, it's just kind of a um, a little well, different than what we're aimed at. But go ahead. Yeah, and, and just to say a little bit more about that, obviously, just, you know, what is the most cost effective way to do this is it'll depend completely on the context. Right. And exactly. so that's the beauty of this system, which is that somebody says, hey, look, we're going to have this in our building. Let's make sure that the designers and the contractors are talking to each other so we can make sure that it is cost effective. Right. right. Th 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 this system yeah. would solve that problem in a generic manner. The owner says, yeah. look, I, you know, this is an outside plaza deck on the third floor of a multifamily, whatever it is. And we're going to use timber frame to do this as opposed to concrete or whatever it is. Now you, you get the people together in the room and they're fully optimized, one hopes, to give you the cost effective solution. Right. Well, and and the second also, question. Yeah, oh, go ahead, go ahead Chris. Sorry. One more point. It's, it's also a good illustration about kind of what we're talking about here and that if, if a building envelope consultant like Morris and Hirschfield is working with a contractor and that question is what we have in front of us as a design bid entity responsible for the design, Corey and I are going to talk back and forth. You know, Corey is going to say, this is what I usually use for this. And we're going to go back and we're going to say, well, this is really needs to be something a little bit different for these particular reasons. And so we're going to meet at the middle working together versus if we're working independently, we're probably gonna go with what we know or what we think is at the, at the least amount of risk to us mm -hmm. individually, which is not necessarily the best solution for the owner, right? And so it's a really good example of why we feel so passionate about this delivery method and what really distinguishes this and sets it apart from how it's normally done today. It is quite different and it offers value and performance um, at a reasonable cost. And, and if I can follow up just one second, Chris, that's a, that's a really good point. And I want to broaden it just slightly is that there are going to be plenty of circumstances within which, Chris, you're going to realize in your conversation with Corey that you're just wrong. You've been doing it this way for a long time because some guy has been doing it that way and telling you it's the way to do it. 
And Corey says, wait a minute, do you know how much it costs for us to do that? Every time you spec it that way, right, the chances of things going wrong are going to be much more, right? And, and exactly the opposite, Corey. You're going to realize yeah. that you are wrong, right? Yeah. So it's not just Absolutely. cutting the baby in half. We're, we're, that, that's, not yeah. the, that's not the answer. You're taking the underlying capacity for judgment within a particular area of knowledge, which is the constructor, the installer, and marrying it with that judgment cap capacity of the designer and bringing it to the table. So that the more you begin to trust each other to solve those problems, Corey, you'll feel comfortable when Chris says, hey, no, 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 that doesn't work because you expect him to explain why it doesn't work, right? As opposed to, hey, this is what the specs say, get lost, buddy. Right. Yeah, and it's it, it goes along the lines too that you know when we're up there and we're saying, well, this is the way we're going to install it. This is the way we always do it. It's going to be a lot cheaper. And then Chris is going to be like, well, then we're not stamping it. And then we're like, yeah. oh, okay. Did I say that? Let's let's pull that back a little bit. You know, and it's going to be the same thing with you know same thing with Chris. Like, I cannot stamp this with the way you're doing it right now. Then we show them a different angle, a different way to skin the cat. And then Chris is like, oh yeah, that that will hold. That will hold. Let's go that route. You know, and it's like, he said it one of the first times that Chris and I met each other is that we're going to go into a room with the design intent, with the performance requirements, roll up our sleeves, get bloody and come out with a, with a building that will not leak, you know? And, and I took it as like a joke, but then he, he is nail on the head. That is exactly what will happen, you know? And it's a really interesting concept. And um, we, we're just, I'm lucky to have run into you guys to try it out. So What's question number two? There was another question. Uh, we're running out of time. Hold on, we got a chat coming in here. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, the, we, you, we can finish up the questions. So I think it's- Oh important. yeah, sure, sure. Um, uh, Chris answered this one. So can you explain more about why the building enclosure designer must be working with the B uh, building enclosure contractor instead of the throw design and throw over transom? And is it possible to engage the building enclosure contractor outside the design build delivery method? I think Chris answered that perfectly, so I'll let you. Okay. Yeah, so, you know, traditionally, you know, our role as an envelope consultant is as an advisor to an owner or a developer or a contractor. We work with all three entities on a regular basis, um, but it's advice and recommendations. And of course, uh, that, that's traditionally what our services are all about. For this particular delivery method that we're proposing, however, it is important that um, the BE consultant and the BE installer EDA in this case, uh, have a contractual relationship whereby we are delivering under a design build as a design build entity uh, for reasons we've talked about you know, throughout the presentation, um, but it is distinctly different from the traditional service that we provide. With the design build delivery method, EDA will now feel comfortable in producing that 10-year installation warranty. This is not the same warranty as the manufacturer's 10-year, five-year, three-year, 20-year warranty. This is completely different. This is EDA coming out to your building within that 10-year time period and fixing anything that happens over the entire enclosure. And I cannot stress this enough. We are talking about an enclosure solution here. We're not talking about providing a 10-year roofing warranty or a 10-year balcony warranty or a 10-year wall warranty. We're talking about everything together. And that's why it's so vitally important for us to be working together, both as the stamped professional, right? The stamping professional and as the installer throughout the entire process. And it extends more to the, the, just the installation. You know, we're talking about what we need to do in the field in terms of testing, for example. Uh, most people on the call are probably familiar with um, sometimes the uh, seemingly like ridiculous number and amount of testing that sometimes envelope consultants require or want to see, um, again, that, that's, about, that's about the risk, right? That's about the risk profile. If I'm working together with, with EDA and we've designed this thing and we've installed this thing, we're gonna get to decide whether we need to do testing or not to satisfy what we're offering to you, which is a 10-year enclosure warranty. If we feel that it's only important to test one window, that's all we're gonna test. But if you have a problem at year five, it doesn't matter if we've tested that window once or a hundred times because we're gonna fix it at year five, no matter how many tests we thought were necessary. Right, exactly. Uh, the last question was um, about EDA being a subcontractor or a general directly for the owner. I mean, that's what we're kind of aiming to change. You know, like right now we are a subcontractor, we take on 
the entire ex exterior envelope, but we get scoped into different parts of it. Um, yeah, so it's, it's kind of a, a loaded question in the sense that you, right now, yeah, we are a subcontractor, but we're trying to um, show that we well, can bring a lot more to the table. Well, let's just say this. It, it, it doesn't matter whether you're a subcontractor or a contractor or what it is. Right. If you provide the warranty, you're responsible for what's there. It's the same thing with the guys who do the fire protection, the fire prevention, all of that stuff. They're subcontractors. That doesn't matter. They have their scope. They're fully responsible. Mm -hmm. They work exactly with the engineering folks to deliver that outcome. Right. So whether they're subcontractors or contractors or how that contract chain works, we know what the responsibility and the scope is. Uh, and, you know, it would be better, I think, in an overall or more general policy way for you to have a direct contract with the owner because the building envelope has so much risk embedded in it, that's a way for the owner to manage that and to give that little chunk off. Uh, but uh, I, I, don't, I don't think in essence, it makes that much of a difference whether you're called a subcontractor or you have the direct to the owner. Yeah, and those are the questions. Uh, Stephanie, is there anything else you would like us to? I don't think so. I think that, gosh, Yuzval, Corey, Katie and Chris, thank you so much for an interesting concept and new, new delivery method that uh, you brought to Spokane and the ideas behind that. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen one more time. You guys seeing it? Yep. Great. Well, I'm going to go back to the first screen because I was remiss uh, in my uh, introduction to not mention the Spokane Building Enclosure. Phil, if you wouldn't mind taking yourself off video and mute, um, I just want to say this, this particular program was brought by the Spokane Building Enclosure Council and Phil Martinson, who is the guy, um, had seen this presentation in, in the Seattle uh, CBEC uh, conference and had um, suggested that we bring this topic uh, to Spokane specifically for architecture. So I really have to thank Phil for doing that. He's really been the person that has brought all of the great topics to Spokane when it, when it, with regards to building enclosures. So I thank you for that. And there'll be some changes, I think, in, in BEC Spokane that we'll let you know as, as they develop here in the next month or so. But thank you, Phil. Really appreciate uh, what you've yeah, done. Thank you, Stephanie, for uh, helping us out. And yeah, we are going to have some changes and hopefully work more with CBEC and have some great webinars coming up. Uh, hopefully we'll know these changes over the next month. We're working with uh, Stephanie and then also with uh, uh, George over at CSI. So with that, uh, I just wanna make do one final plug for the Architecture Month this week and then going into next week as well. Um, Tomorrow we have the Pine Creek Community Restoration recovering from the Malden fire. Um, I know many of you know uh, what sort of wildfires we all experienced here in Eastern Washington. Uh, this has been a build, real community effort to get this, this town back and going and there still is help needed through the architecture world. So please uh, register for this particular community presentation and I think you'll learn a lot and learn how you might be able to help out. Um, then on Wednesday, we have um, the Riverfront Park Ice Age Flood Playground Part 1. That's the virtual presentation. And then we follow on the very next day in the afternoon for our first in-person tour since uh, this COVID thing happened. Um, and we'll actually be doing an in-person tour for anybody that is an AIA or IIDA member or ASLA member. So you can... Uh, you can sign up for elbows on our website and then we're get, then we're going to bring it into next week which is uh, not technically architecture month but a great presentation as well right above where the playground is we have the podium part part one inception through construction uh, this is the whole design build team will be presenting on this so lots of good stuff happening and lots of opportunity to get credits and with that i uh, just again want to thank csi spokane for their sponsorship um, of the $50 gift card raffle. Uh, today's winner is Sheila Gates Ping of BWA. Sheila, we'll go ahead and email you um, how you will we'll make sure and get that uh, gift card to you. So with that, I have nothing else. Just wanna thank everybody for attending and for our fabulous presenters and the topic today. Everybody have a great afternoon and we'll see you uh, the rest of this week at, at some of our other presentations. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you, Stephanie. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, Phil.